Hello, I'm Scott Willis, and I'm I'm a I'm a researcher at Centre for Sustainability at the moment, which is really fun. It's nice to be back. <laughs> um, a couple of health and safety things. If there's an earthquake, drop and cover, and then we'll find our way out either through that door or that one down there to the mustering area on the street. And toilets are just through this door. I think that's all I need to tell you about that. And apart from that, I'd just like to um, introduce our speaker for today, Julianne Genta. I'm absolutely delighted, has spent a couple of days, or spending a couple of days in Dunedin to talk about energy, transport, and good urban design. And one of the things, and I mean, I know you all know Julianne from her work in the previous government, but one of the things that I think clearly comes out in um, her presentations and her work is her pre-politician life as a transportation planner. And it's really important in politics that we have people who understand what they're talking about. <laughs> so she's strategically positioned in a cooperation as a, as a Green and the cooperation arrangement with the government to make some change. And I'm really keen to see what we're going to discover about where we can go in the next term and where we'd like to go in the next decade as we transition to zero carbon. So I'd like to everyone put your hands together for Julian. <laughs> It's a real pleasure to be down here uh, in Dunedin, especially these past two days, which I'm sure are just classic autumn days in Dunedin. Um, this is exactly the weather I should expect if I moved down here, right? Um, it's a real, and also I just want to thank you all for coming to the seminar. And I'll tell you, my goal is not to talk at you the whole time. So I've set my alarm and I'm gonna try and get through these slides in about 25 minutes. And I will ask you some questions and try to get some audience participation, but let's leave time at the end for real content questions and discussion. And I'm also aware that some of you might be total experts in the some of the fields I'll talk about briefly and, um, and others might be coming from a different background. So I'm just gonna assume kind of uh, a basic level of knowledge and no insult to you if you actually know way more than me about energy systems and energy markets because I'm the Green Party's energy spokesperson but only uh, for the last few months have I taken on that role and so I will briefly allude to Green Party policy on that but most of my talk will focus on transport and urban design because transport is the single biggest contributor to our greenhouse gases from energy and how we design our cities and enable people to get around. And the buildings that we build are big impacts. They have big impacts on how much energy we need. And we not only need clean energy, but we need to use it more efficiently, design in ways that are more energy efficient. So I'll just start by saying, asking you to imagine 15 years from now, you wake up in your simple, energy efficient, lovely, warm, dry home. And after breakfast, you walk out the door and you're walking down this really wide path. It's quite, it's quite quiet. You can hear birds. It's lined with native plants. And the other major noise you hear is the kids laughing and talking and their bicycles whirring as they're on their way to school on the adjacent cycle path. You get down to the major junction that used to be the major car intersection, right? But actually now it's uh, where you're gonna catch your electric public transport that comes every five minutes you know, in the morning, uh, gets you to town. And it's also the area, it's sort of like a gathering place. That's where you've got your local shops and your uh, market um, once a week where you can get your veggies, local organic producers market. Um, so you see a whole lot of your neighbors and people who live in the neighborhood as you walk down this path and you get on your public transport. And also um, on this junction on some side streets, there's a couple of cars strategically placed. They're all electric. A couple of them are large, more utility style vans. And, and most of them are a couple of passenger cars. And anytime you need to use a car, because you have to go somewhere off peak or go out of town, you're able to use the same device you use to pay for your public transport 
to uh, book one of these cars and you pay for it for the time you use it. And it's fully electric. You don't have to pay the cost of ownership. They get renewed um, every few years. They're well-maintained. How's that sound? Okay, great. Um, it's actually not some utopian dream. Um, if you go to some parts of Europe, uh, this, is, this has been happening for 20, 30 years. Um, this is a, a town, um, it's actually a neighborhood outside Freiburg, which is in Baden-Württemberg in Southwest Germany. Um, and they have this uh, greenfields development that happened in the early 2000s called Vauban. And this is a, a city of, it's a university town, 200,000 people. Uh, there's five light rail lines. They were building two more when I was there. Uh, they built this light rail to the Greenfields development before any of the housing or businesses went in. And it's totally linked to the city center uh, by really nice wide cycle paths. And the main, I mean, basically you move into this neighborhood, you're much less likely to own a car than other parts of Germany. Uh, you're much, they have higher cycle mode share than public transport, despite having really great public transport services. Um, and uh, these are some other views of it. A lot of solar um, houses all built to, when I say houses, you can see they're all kind of multi-family dwellings mostly, um, not standalone houses, but the families had a lot of input into how these buildings were developed because the way they auctioned off the land, they families would get together and hire an architect and design their own multifamily building within certain criteria. But they were all built to passive house standard, which was ahead of the regulations at the time. Now I think that's the standard in Germany, um, which is the most kind of scientifically researched um, high thermal performance standard for buildings. And um, so have you noticed anything about these pictures that's different than Dunedin? Yes, there's no cars in these pictures. And yet these people live their lives. They go to work, they do shopping, they have children without necessarily using a car for every trip. So it is possible. And in fact, because this neighborhood Vauban has the cars kept on the outside of the neighborhood, except for a couple of car share vehicles, which everyone can access with their public transport pass. Um, they have an enormous amount of parks. They have these huge parks. And despite it being high density relative to the type of development we have in New Zealand, it's incredibly quiet. It doesn't feel busy. You don't have that constant noise. If you remember lockdown, do you notice how quiet it was? And you could hear the birds, the air was cleaner. We could have all that and still go about our lives and meet each other um, if we designed our cities differently. But alas, in New Zealand, most people need to use a car to get most places. Would you say that's true? And I think the key observation here is not that New Zealanders have some crazy love affair with a car, but that they need a car practically to be able to do things. And that's down to decisions that are made by central and local government um, city engineers, traffic engineers, and planners. And if we make different decisions, then we will give people different options. And everywhere we have done that, such as in Auckland, uh, most recently, people use it, it's incredibly successful, makes a lot of economic sense. So the barrier to delivering this stuff is not economic. It's not because people don't want it, um, but it does mean that we do have to change some things. Um, I focus on the cost, it's fine. So this is all about climate change, but I actually think it's worth even just focusing on the financial cost um, because people often think we can't afford to do things differently. And I would say we can't afford to keep doing what we're doing. Central government pre-COVID and pre-New Zealand upgrade, central government was spending about $4 billion a year on transport. Now it's harder to calculate what it is now because they've put a lot of crown funding into shovel rip quote unquote, shovel ready projects. Um, but you know, the National Land Transport Fund was about 4 billion a year. And the National Land Transport Fund, does everyone know where that comes from? Where that money comes from? 
in particular taxes? Fuel taxes. Fuel taxes and road user charges is the National Land Transport Fund. Um, so everybody has to pay that if they're uh, driving a petrol or diesel car. Um, local government's been spending about a billion dollars a year on transport from rates, mainly. Some user charges, mainly rates. And the most of that money, so it was about, you know, pre-COVID, it was about four, five billion dollars a year. Right now, arguably, it's a little bit more on transport infrastructure. Most of that was being spent on building and maintaining roads and policing roads. An amount on public transport subsidies, um, less than a billion, what well, well, and are um, probably about 600 million on public transport and even less on active transport. Um, but in order to use that infrastructure that central government's building with our um, contributions through fuel taxes and reducer charges and rates, uh, we need vehicles and fuel to run them. And if you look at that cost, all of that is imported. So no, we don't make our own vehicles here. If you're driving an EV, the electricity is generated here, but that's less than 1% of the fleet. So we import all our petrol right from our cars. Um, arguably spending $15 billion a year on vehicles and fuel to run them. So almost three times as much as government spending on the infrastructure for us to use it. And then if we, I've, there's going to be a surface transport costs and charges report update the Ministry of Transport has done. And a friend of mine who's a transport economist has done work, and I don't know if it's publicly available yet, but I'm not surprised it backs up kind of what we would have estimated previously that the annual value of all, all the parking to store our vehicles is about equivalent to that. It's about $15 billion a year. And that some of that is incredibly valuable land in our towns and cities <laughs> where we could build more homes or have more parks or have more businesses, schools, all the things that make the city worthwhile and why we have cities. Uh, that car parking, 70 to 80% of it will be off street and off street car parking takes up a lot more space than on street. If you think about it, an on street car park is about eight meters squared. It's about the size of a car, slightly bigger. An off street car park, if you imagine countdown, uh, it's about 25 meters squared per car park. So about three times as much space. So uh, that's because you need all that room for maneuvering the cars around the car park. And so an enormous amount of urban land is taken up by car parking that has previously been required by district planning rules. <clears throat> and because of the way we manage it and the way it's all associated with kind of individual land uses, there's three to four empty car parks for everyone being used. So the majority of this land is just sitting empty, waiting for its turn to store some vehicles. So the total cost of our car-based transport system is actually quite enormous. And that's why I argue it's actually very affordable and possible for us to invest in the alternatives uh, because we can be saving all of this as a cost to New Zealand's productivity. Um, we have the highest car ownership in the OECD, I believe. We've sort of been just behind the United States and I think we just overtook them somehow. Um, and that's, uh, that's not, I don't think that's something that we can be proud of. I mean, if anything, I guess it's a sign that more cars isn't going to make us happier or more productive. If the countries, some of the countries that we might aspire to that have higher living standards or um, have lower car ownership, it is absolutely possible to achieve that. And uh, transport has been our fastest growing sector of carbon emissions, which need to have in 10 years. So in addition to just the financial reasons, we actually have a very compelling reason why we need to change what we're doing. And that is that uh, our transport emissions have been going in the wrong direction. They've been increasing when we needed to decrease them. And um, this is a sort of complicated chart, but I think it's worth spending some time on because a lot of people assume that the way we're gonna solve our transport emissions problem is replacing all of our private cars with EVs. But that, that isn't really 
the best solution from an energy efficiency point of view? Yes, EVs are going to be really useful to us. And the fact that we have such high renewable electricity generation makes them very attractive from a climate point of view. Um, this is sort of like your, so this is the carbon footprint and you can see EV is, is small, but this is your space footprint. So how much land's taken up. And you can get, you know, much lower emissions. Anyone want to listen to <laughs> <laughs> um, By changing the modes and the people, the way that people are able to get around um, is as important as switching out the fuel that's running our vehicles. And that's, it's just like one charge on your electric bike, you know, or is going to get you uh, 30 times further than the same amount of electricity going into your Tesla. And that should be obvious, right? If you're not traveling around with this big, like one or two ton vehicle, and many, many trips at peak time are just one person in one car, not carrying a lot of heavy stuff. And uh, those are the ones that we need to make easier to happen in other ways, because this will be the future with EVs. <laughs> Um, just as much traffic congestion, very, very high transport costs, lots of land used up by cars at a time where we really can't afford it. Not to mention the fact that most car owners in New Zealand could not go out right now and buy an EV, even if the government was offering a several thousand dollar subsidy. And the EV manufacturers can't even make enough for that to happen in a short period of time. Um, there's been, I don't know if anyone saw this article recently. Uh, so it's based on a, an academic study and it might be worth, sorry, I didn't actually put the reference in here, but I'm sure I could find it. Um, this was just published at the end of March and they went through all of the detail and said, cycling is 10 times more important than EVs for reducing carbon emissions from transport in our cities. And then there's the land use planning aspect of that. And so I'll just briefly touch upon this. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking about uh, land use planning and why it's led us to the situation of high car dependence. And basically what it comes down to is we had a lot of urban planning rules and we still have a lot of traffic engineering practice that just takes as a fundamental basic assumption that the highest priority is moving vehicles quickly through an area and that undervalues um, many of the other things we might want in a city like uh, a nice atmosphere for people to be able to walk and cycle easily um, good public transport access, public transport priority. Um, but particularly around crossings and things, this is um, an aerial shot of Botany Town Centre <laughs> in Auckland. And this is the environment that has very much been created by traffic engineering and city planning rules. Um, so those, the parking I was talking about, you can see all this land used for off-street car parking. That was generally required by planning rules and probably the big box retailers have really thrived in this environment because they have externalized their transport costs and they tended to be the only ones fighting regulatory change that would make it possible to you know actually provide some shops with less car parking in a more walkable environment but these um you know you see these sort of arterial roads uh, that get wider you know, make it really easy to turn left, uh, slip lane, um, creates these huge intersections that are extremely difficult to cross as a pedestrian and really unpleasant. Like it's not surprising in this environment that everyone uses a car to get everywhere, even to get from this shop to this shop because the whole environment's only been designed around cars. And, and then you think, oh, we have a housing affordability problem and a land supply problem in Auckland. Well, here's your land supply problem. <laughs> then look at these houses. Um, taking up a lot of land. So um, there is an opportunity to do things differently. So um, I'd just like to interrupt because look above the big white roof shop is a very idyllic area of parkland with little <coughs> pedestrian paths just at the very edge of the picture. Mm -hmm. And I just looking at that, I was rather engaged. With how lovely that looked mm -hmm. and so you know even in this photo you're able to show what can be done mm -hmm. yeah and i guess the the key 
I guess the key thing that I found um, is that originally when I started doing this work, I thought, this is great. We don't need to force people out of their cars. We just need to change the rules and change the planning practice so that they can do something else and we can provide more housing within the existing urban area. But then <laughs> um, we tried to do that. I mean, we tried to, we got, we're getting rid of minimum parking requirements completely. We're allowing more density around public transport. We wrote a government policy statement last term that prioritized uh, mode shift and public transport. Um, but the agency, the transport agency was unable to really deliver it because they couldn't let go of some of the really big expensive highway projects that they've been planning for many years. And you can't do both. You know, there's not, there's no, you can't do both. You've got to give up one of these things. And then when we uh, made it really easy for councils to do tactical urbanism, or we tried to, which is to reclaim street space in an inexpensive way that central government was paying for to remove car parking and you know create more pedestrian oriented infrastructure intersections cycle lanes we found there's a lot of local political pushback that it was very difficult to deliver so what i would say now is i mean we definitely need to change the rules and we need to change the budgets and we need to change the prioritization and some of that comes down to really detailed engineering practice, like traffic impact assessments that councils require for new developments are entirely about cars. They don't ask the question, how do we make it easier for pedestrians to safely cross the road or for, create a people-friendly environment? And that practice all needs to change if we're gonna get a different outcome. But also um, in the reclaiming of the street space for people, uh, this is going to be a political fight because there's always inertia around the status quo and people can't imagine things being different and they don't like the idea that you're taking away something they thought was theirs, maybe an on-street car park in front of their shop. So there has to be kind of a big campaign to help people understand why it's so important that we provide alternatives to people and why we design our cities around people. Um, and so, you know, if you separate the space and you make it really, wide and give that priority to people using bikes, they will use it. If you don't do this on all the high traffic roads, like that have fast moving traffic or a certain volume of traffic across the city in a connected network, then you'll never see the uptake in cycling that you could have. And we've just been doing little bits and little bits and it's very hard for people to see the benefit of that. Um, unless you do, and you know, I've got a few other pictures. This is like downtown Vancouver. The retailers initially fought this and were totally opposed to it. And now they're asking for more. And that's happened in every city they've done this in. So I think helping our local authority, authorities, whether they're staff or elected officials have the confidence to do the right thing, even though people will complain. It's not, it's not a sign that you should stop doing what you're doing. Because this happened in Manhattan, where 90% of the people were not in cars and 10% of the people were, and 90% of the public space was given to the cars. And they pedestrianized Times Square, and people went out and said, No one's going to come to the theater in Times Square. <laughs> I mean, it's such an absurd thing, but um, that's so that you'll see it's like a very familiar thing in Berlin, in Edinburgh, and every but every place I've ever talked to people in Paris where they've reclaimed street space, there has been retailers on the front page, their arms crossed. There've been staging of funerals saying it's the death of the area. It's very predictable and you cannot get people inside with facts and figures. You just need to show it. And about a year later, if you do it well, they'll be on site. Um, and I just, I just think for me, the biggest thing is it's, it's really about the kids. I'm going to get all teary <laughs> for climate change, but also just their right to be independent in their neighborhoods that they've completely lost. And they get so like, if they're able to walk and cycle to school, they learn better when they get to school, their behavior is better. They understand their neighborhood better. They learn more than being put in the backseat of a car and carted from location to location. And so I feel this is the biggest driving thing for me is 
making our cities child friendly. And I often get um, concerned comments from mothers who cannot imagine. They say, oh, if you've got three kids or you've got two kids, you're gonna, you, you can't do it without a car. Um, but of course, there's all sorts of new bicycle technology that makes it really practical and easy and enjoyable. The main thing that puts people off is the traffic and the perception that they're gonna be killed by a motor vehicle, which is a very real fear that you should have if you're riding on the streets, as I do with my toddler and my partner does. And so it's all about reclaiming the space um, and saying these people have a right to get around without a car and not be injured or killed. Um, and then there's, it's really interesting in the places where they've really gone for cycles, cycling as a practical way of getting around cities. Um, what they've found is that um, there's been a lot of innovation in e-bikes and e-cargo trikes, and that in the Netherlands, they're finding that the, some of the couriers or different businesses that had to travel around the city a lot were massively increasing their productivity by switching to a cargo trike. They didn't have to spend as much time looking for parking. They got around faster because of the bike lanes giving really good priority and being really wide. Um, and so there's all sorts of ways in which businesses and um, others adapt to the situation that could actually benefit them. So it's not, it's not a barrier. And then I'll just like briefly talk about um, what we can do with electricity. I mean, once we've solved our transport and urban planning issues, and of course, increase the building codes so that we have efficient buildings. So we're using less power to heat them. Um, the Green Party's energy plan is really about drawing a line in the sand and saying, look, we, we need to set a target and work backwards from that. And we need to get there. And that has to be based on the science of staying below 1.5 and doing our fair share. Um, so, you know, by 2030, we want to um, just stop all coal imports by 2030. And there's a heck of a lot of work that's going to need to go into making that happen. Um, we need more renewable electricity generation as well as using energy more efficiently. Um, and so part of how we get that is simplifying some planning rules around community wind. Uh, we need a smarter grid and I don't know all the solutions so I'd be interested if people have any. <laughs> um, and, we, and we need to facilitate more distributed generation so that um, it's not totally reliant. I mean, the grid is incredibly useful, <coughs> but there's also the potential to do things in a more resilient way. Um, and then we have our energy efficiency. And briefly, I just have some photos uh, because I know in this part of the country, particularly if you go up to uh, around Queenstown, there's a lot of sort of semi-rural or rural areas that have a lot of uh, tourism. And they and this is, the solutions I'm talking about are not just for cities. Um, actually, this is a, a, a tourist town uh, that gets a heck of a lot of visitors in the Netherlands, completely car free and built around canals and uh, walking and cycling paths. But you can get, it's like more than an hour from Amsterdam, like they have connected public transport to get from the airport to here. Um, and it's not just rail, it's bus. Um, this is a, there's two car free villages in the mountains in Switzerland. Um, and I'm forgetting the name of this one, but um, this is Zermatt. Uh, ski towns, no private cars have been allowed there. They've had electric, locally produced electric taxis and buses since the 1970s. That the producers, the, the brothers make them and they never scaled up and they never felt like selling the IP. And so they were 50 years ahead of everywhere else. Um, but just there's all different kinds of ways of living. And whether it's a rural area or it's a city, um, we have done it without cars in the past and we can do it again or with a car reduction plan. So it's gotta be a, a kind of transition. And even in New Zealand, we had passenger rail all over the South Island when we had a much smaller population. Um, and it, you know, there's nothing inherent about the population or geographic spread that makes it impractical to have passenger rail, which is a very, it can be very energy efficient. Obviously, it's never been electrified, I don't think, in the South Island, but you did have electric trams in at least three cities in the South Island and six in the North Island. So this is just, we can design the future we want. Um, and I'll also show you a more urban kind of transition.
Uh -oh, I'm no longer screen sharing with the video. Is that okay? Yeah, if you want to just pop your things on, and I'll somehow I need to click something. Technology. Seems like a good opportunity to do this hybrid room. Yeah, potentially. Oh, we just need to press enter for that. Oh, we just okay. Yeah, that. Oh, that's your okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. 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 This is what it looks like on the ground, something like this, where most of the land is taken up for moving and storing vehicles. How could this be different? Well, we need more housing. Um, we need more transport options. Doesn't have to be high rise, but if we were using our land differently, um, we could be providing a lot more homes within the existing urban area in a way that enhances the livability of the area. Um, and once you allow this sort of thing, you know, there's still cars in this picture. It's not car free but there are hugely more options for walking and cycling and taking public transport and living near things. Um, and our like, approach to planning and zoning has kind of prevented this sort of development from happening, mixed use, uh, medium rise and higher density. And of course, once, once you get a lot more people living in an area, then you can support things that people need nearby, like markets and places to buy vegetables and food. Um, so going back, oh, I've got one more. Um, right, so maybe I'll just start with the question about hydrogen, although I'm not an expert on this. I'm not totally opposed to it. Um, I figure hydrogen or even uh, battery electric, electric with intermittent overhead wires could be viable for trains in different parts of the country. Okay, so yeah, yeah, you go. I mean, it shouldn't be either or, I think, because of all the options uh, going forward. But, uh, yeah. Well, one thing I have been thinking about, and I'm, I'm not, I haven't done the analysis, but I wonder if anyone is, is thinking about if we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050, a lot of the things we're planning on using to reduce our fossil fuel use um, still require things that are produced with fossil fuels now. Mm -hmm. And so if, for example, it's like, who's, how are we making the EVs and transporting them to New Zealand in 2060? Probably yeah. yeah. So I feel the budget should be more focused, our carbon budget seems to be focused on prioritizing the infrastructure that is going to be the most long lived and the most efficient at get moving people and goods around or um, generating electricity now, like that's what we should be spending our remaining carbon emissions on, yeah. uh, rather than just continuing to drive around in our fossil fuel cars until the last possible minute. And, uh, and then we're like, oh, now what are we gonna do? I, I just, yeah. We have to generate more electricity in a renewable way because we can't do any of those things if we're not generating more. Yeah. We've got to replace fossil energy of some sort. So wind, solar, energy sources, that's what this priority. Uh, just one other question before I take over totally with the discussion um, or comment, really. You mentioned in, in Freiburg um, that they put all the, the, the transport plan in place before they started building. And I guess this is one of the challenges. You can modify human behavior if it's already there. But like, as you said, we've got bits of cycle paths here and there, particularly in Christchurch, I was noticing like a path that just stopped and you've got this busy intersection that's really hard to get across to the other bit of the path that's starting somewhere else. That doesn't encourage people to do this stuff. So, and as far as I can tell, one of the big barriers to delivering good cycleways or changing intersection design is that there isn't total buy-in and understanding of how to do things differently from mainly engineers and some councils and planners and definitely the transport agency. Some people there, many people there. Um, and so you'll get, a, oh, we can't do that because it'll reduce level of service for vehicles or, you know, and so they're not 
confronting the reality that you have to reduce level of service for vehicles if you're going to increase level of service. The number one priority has to be level of service for people on foot, people on bikes, public transport, commercial vehicles. Uh, did you want to say something about hydrogen trains? Oh. Well, I, 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 yeah, just on, on hydrogen and, and or electrification, I know first gas saying you don't have to change anything. We're here with hydrogen, we just switch fuels. Hydrogen is not free, of course. So there, there is a, there's quite a number of economic challenges with hydrogen and, um, and it does require for green hydrogen to decarbonize renewable generation that has already um, many viable pathways to power our transport system. So it's it's a, it's an interesting question. It's a very much an open question how useful hydrogen will be for long haul um, passenger or freight. And it may stack up against um, electric and, and battery, but it, 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 it's not looking particularly positive at the moment. Yeah, so I guess of the two main comments around that, one I think we've got to be very careful as a community and just to decarbonise it, not get too much internal friction between all the possible options because we don't yet know if you want to say we don't yet know what some of the answers are going to be. Because we just make part of the politicians to actually put policy in place. The, the first priority is to get it smooth. And probably all of these things will find a place. I think that portability and industrial will be made on a large scale on fossil fuels. To make fertilizer, for example, this is a massive part of that energy consumption, a large part of the of carbon emissions. So, regardless of whether you use it for transport or not, we need as a country to make it. We make fertilizer. And we only make a third of the fertilizer we need from currently to make it. Sorry, I, 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 yeah. So, we can have hydrogen anyway, and we can see where it goes from there, but we have to start putting it in place. I think we could probably yeah. take that, that question about fertilizer, whether we need fertilizer. Oh. Because um, we're, I don't I want to say topic, 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 topic for today. To make zero, it's going to take us time to get down to only use what we're currently making. We're currently making zero hydrogen. The other comment that you made is that hydrogen has to be made using energy. I agree. Any way you want to store energy is going to cost you energy. It doesn't matter if you're pumping water up to a um, Lake Bonsu, that's not free, right? It costs you money to pump water up there. It costs you money to make hydrogen. It costs you money to fix CO2 and make a liquid fuel. That all costs money, which is going to be when a Right. <laughs> I saw a hand down here. Yeah, just um, oh, first an observation. As a younger fitter man, we, as a cycle career in Sydney, we used a Dutch cargo bikes occasionally, but no electric motors, so we were the purists. And um, as an old fitter man, now I have an e-bike, so it's you know times change. But um, yeah, just putting my sort of really bad transport reporter hat on from some years ago. I think uh, something that always used to frustrate me was the language that we use and the comparisons we make. So, so with Vision Zero, we're going to have this model from Sweden and we're going to spend you know, a thousandth on roads, but we're going to use the same terminology. And I just wonder if some of the, um, you know, these idyllic settings from um, the south of Germany with a train trundling along, will probably to put that train in place probably costs about the GDP of New Zealand, you know. So, no way, no, so, no. Our infrastructure no, no, costs are way higher here. Yeah, yeah. But just on the funding model, do you think we're increasingly going to have to have the dreaded public private partnership? Or, or how do you see that funding model kind of evolving? Because, you know, if you drive to Christchurch, it's a painful experience. We should be on a fast electric train, you know, an old Eurostar brought over these, maybe using Chinese technology, putting infrastructure in, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, how do you see that, you know, realistically speaking, how do you see that model sort of breaking down so it's a 15-year reality as opposed to a 50-year kind of, I wish we had? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that we need to do public-private partnerships. I just don't see in a transport environment where costs and benefits are like so diffuse. Um, that it's easy to set up a commercial model that 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 pays for itself. Um, there's economic benefits to investment in certain projects over others, but the economic benefits are hard to capture in user charges because there's so many market distortions in transport as it is. Like we've unintentionally subsidized cars so much that it's really hard. That's why we have to subsidize public transport. The interesting thing in Freiburg is they only have like 26% public transport mode share because they get up to like 50% cycle mode share. 
um, in the summer, very bad, you know, it's very cold in the winter there, uh, snow, um, but uh, they, um, their cost recovery on public transport is like 80%, which is way higher than ours. And that's just an example of how if you set out to get high cost recovery by lowering the frequency of your services, you will not achieve it. Um, you have to put the infrastructure in and you have to run the services frequently and then you get a lot more people using them. And then eventually you can get to a place where you have reasonably affordable public transport that almost pays for itself. And But the there's wider economic benefits and social benefits to investing in that connectivity. So it makes sense economically, but it's hard to bring in a private investor and say, you can make money off this. That's why I think it's such a core like public good thing that the public needs to invest in. Yeah. But, um, but also the cost of these projects, there's no question, like delivering busways in New Zealand right now costs more than delivering light rail per kilometer in France. So part of it is, this is something I'm really interested in, is like infrastructure costs are really, really high here. And there's got to be ways that we can improve that so that it's, we're not, you know, um, I definitely think we could deliver light rail and for within our existing transport budget uh, because it just means giving up some of the really crazy expensive highway projects that just don't do anything. They just don't benefit anyone, really. I mean, there'll be a perception of local benefit, which is why there's a political economy around it. But we know that it's not going to solve congestion, putting a new link between two highways in Auckland. You know, like that's... The, <laughs> you're barely increasing capacity um, and the car and you'll eventually just get more cars. So, uh, so I, so I do think it's possible for this to be affordable um, and achievable, but we do need to massively increase capacity and capability in engineering and infrastructure delivery to do it. So we got out of it. Peter, Dan, and there's one over here. And we get, there's a woman right there. Oh, sorry. Um, why don't we just roll the right on charging for transport, especially road transport, given that the Planning Commission refers to that, doesn't take any to that. But we won't have a word about the general cost and the general transport um, studies down to 50% subsidy. We have $6 billion subsidy for total, co total costs from the road user. Yet there's no move to introduce proper rational road charging like they do in some other places. So we can start to begin to change that funds and change the sense of entitlement. So when I drive down the road, I think I own it because I pay for it. Well, in fact, I have to pay for the entire factory. What percent from the car's owner cars have a right? It could be challenged by saying, well, look, here are the costs, and we've got to start putting those costs in place. So suddenly, active transport trade all will come to the owner because they have lower subsidy. Yeah, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. You're saying that car users aren't paying the full cost of using cars, and if they did face them, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the government is looking at an alternative to fuel tax because if we get a bunch of EVs, we're going to need some way of paying for the roads, and they are looking at um, that could include time of use and congestion style charging. So, uh, actually, the uh, Transport and Infrastructure Select Committee of which I'm deputy chair, is running an inquiry on congestion charging in Auckland. So it may not be of great interest to you, but I think it will have ramifications for the rest of the country eventually. We're running this inquiry now. So if anybody wants to make a submission, submissions are open. If you're interested in participating in that, you should make a submission. Yeah, go, we'll have some gender balance. <laughs> Thanks. I was looking at your pictures and most of them, show a separate cycleway and a separate footpath. And I'm this is to not a good to the cycleway design, by no, the way. No, 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 that's fine. But there's, I've traveled a lot and seen a lot of shared um, shared routes where you expand the footpath and the cyclists. They all share, but there seems to be quite a lot of antagonism around the communities about the shared paths uh, in New Zealand. Because it's a much cheaper and more easier way of providing alternative transport. I was wondering what is your design? Yeah, I think best practice safety design would have separated a wide separated cycle path as well as a, a wide footpath. Um, and I, I'm not totally 
I mean, if that can't be achieved, I think shared paths have their places in areas where there's low pedestrian volumes. But um, I think the ideal standard is definitely separation for faster. So you it's sort of like you have your fastest vehicles, which are the cars and trucks. And then you have this next class of vehicles, which are going somewhere between 15 and even 30 kilometers an hour on e-scooters and e-bikes and bikes. And then you've got the slower um, pedestrians who are going about four or five kilometers an hour. And keeping them separate is probably safest and will achieve the most in terms of benefits for people walking and cycling. Peter. Uh, well, getting back to the very first principles of why we're here. Well, bugger 1.5 degrees, how about 0, 0.0? Why, why should we in this room have the same estimation for climate that probably the natural body is by now? So yeah, yeah, let's have 0, 0 degree. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's physically possible now. Are there any physicists like in the room? I would be great if it was, but I think we've already got over one degree of warming since oh, well, pre-industrial you know, levels. I know, I know. it's, it's 1.2 this year. Uh, yeah. It's been announced just the other day. But, but I mean, as our target. Yeah. I think that, I think that for people, for example, representing the room, people actually care about this stuff. We need to hold the aspiration of zero global warming and, and, and actually not just stop global warming from continuing, but actually reverse it. Yeah. Dan. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. I um, hardly got to this already, but I sort of want to ask you a question about um, mass transit in particular, urban mass transit, maybe setting aside the intercity stuff and a lot of your slides have lovely um, active transit, but there's also these great pictures of buses and trams. And I'm just um, sort of wondering, I mean, my cursory read of the Climate Change Commission's um, recommendations is sort of an, an unambitious kind of focus on expanding urban mass transit. And I just happened to see the Otago Regional Commission's budget mailer that came and looks like, if I read it correctly, there's essentially status quo for 10 years. Maybe by maybe turning over the fleet or something. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, you know, in, in places like the meeting, my read is it's not so much about building bus rapid transit or imagine light rail is not on the immediate horizon, but simply um, increasing service dramatically. You know, this a bus every 60 minutes about uh, peak is not going to get people out of Yeah, totally. Hours. So I'm just wondering, what is the Greens' vision of sort of a political path toward overcoming that? Getting escape velocity or overcoming that path to the sort of dramatic build out of expansion of mass transit. Um, as a visitor, I don't totally understand the local national funding arrangements, but how do you get funds down to the regions to do that? Well, it should have happened through the government policy statement on transport funding. Um, and that's where the central government sets out like a 10 year vision and um, approximate budgets, and then it's up to the New Zealand Transport Agency to determine the specific budgets. And they, they work in activity classes. So there's like a bucket for new state highways and a bucket for state highway maintenance and a bucket for local roads and, and then one for public transport and one for mass transit, rapid transit. And uh, all I can say is, and this is, I'm just going to be totally frank with you, uh, we changed the the budget when we came into government in 2017 and we said no we're not going to keep this increasing line for new state highways uh, which is a lot more money going towards not a lot of stuff and we want to reallocate some of that okay we understand you got to finish your state highway projects but we'll increase the money for road maintenance we'll increase the money for safety it's very similar to what the biden administration has just proposed um, their transportation secretary in the U.S. Has, has actually went harder than we did, probably on no new roads and just improved the safety and rebuild bridges and improve maintenance of existing roads, and then put most of the new capital expenditure into public transport, rapid transit, increase the funding for services, and reduce fares, because our public transport fares are generally too high in New Zealand. I think Orbus has done something really good with the $2 flat fare and the free transfers. That's brilliant and a really good example of how you can reduce fares and increase revenue, <laughs> which is what happened in Queenstown. Um, so um, that should have happened, but the transport agency didn't really believe in what we were doing and used their management of the activity classes to basically not increase funding for public transport. 
it's hard to explain the how and why, but that's what they did. And now I know the current transport minister is really onto this and trying to get them to change direction, but it's really hard because they've committed themselves to a lot of big projects, um, which, so it's like, we, we've just got to stop doing some of those things and put more money into other things. And we need to give regional councils the resources to drastically scale up public transport, which is gonna be really hard in a place like Otago, um, where the regional council just doesn't have a lot of expertise. I mean, you have one councillor who's really passionate about this stuff, but they don't have a lot of expertise or interest in public transport. So I think central government has to provide the resource and the expertise to enable this to happen outside of Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, Hamilton, and Tonga. Mm -hmm. Here's just a reflection on, on the situation in Christchurch over the last 10 years is the rebuilding going on, particularly in the CBD. Have we missed an opportunity to showcase what this new city might have looked like, given, you know, huge amount of investment and the, the ability to have a, a rejig of the whole setup in Christchurch? Is, is that a, a missed opportunity? Uh, yes and no. I mean, definitely the share and idea process that the council ran right after the earthquakes was like asking for this, you know? Um, and then we had a national government who was totally uninterested. And yet Christchurch has done more investment in cycleways than any city in New Zealand. And it's really starting to reap the benefits of that. Admittedly, they also have a lot of car dependent sprawl, um, but there's affordable, nice, warm, dry apartments in the city center, a pretty nice downtown environment. Um, and, and it's possible to get right across the city to the university, to um, inner suburbs on bikes without having to interact with traffic too much. And as they finish their, because they get a lot of funding through Shovel Ready that they're actually using for cycleways, which is great. And the experience of cycling in Christchurch is just, a whole nother level from any other city in New Zealand right now. So I think that's good, that's possible, but yeah, it's falls pretty far short of what it could have been. I was gonna say two last questions, but if that, uh, Brian, we've got one over here, and then Alex, and I might be squeaked on. Um, so I looked out on the state highway out to the Chalmers, and I live right on the highway. So there's this really interesting back on the river, there's a road going past my house that always has a lot of single use cars and a huge amount of trucks on it going out to the port or going from Port Otago and Port Chalmers to the city port. Then there's the shared hub uh, cycleway, which is lovely and always full of cyclists and walkers, uh, just like literally just across the road. And then there's this train track that's really underutilized, and there's only maybe one train that goes along in an hour. Um, between the two ports. And I'm just wondering, to me, one of the quickest things we could do is take those trucks off of the road to make it safer for pedestrians and put those trucks onto that train track that's already there and is so underutilized. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to how we can do that. Yeah, and I can't speak to the exact detail because I don't know the exact detail of that line and what capacity constraints there might be. Um, even if there's only one train an hour, um, there might be other constraints because um, when it comes to operations planning on rail lines, if it's a single if it's a single track and not a double track, then it will be lower <coughs> capacity because trains can't pass each other. And, and I don't know how many passing loops there are and stuff like that. So there's some like technical stuff that I can't speak to uh, without looking at it closely. But um, uh, by and large, again, central government through our policy statement was talking about mode shift for freight and greater investment. I, I think the key thing that we tried to do is to get the agencies and local government to work together to look at the problem differently. So rather than being like, uh, we just need another road here and that's what we're gonna put all our energy into. It's more like, how do we move more people and goods around the region and how do we develop a strategy that ensures that we're investing in infrastructure that's going to enable that. And because Kiwi Rail and the rail system was like privatized, privatized for a long time and even key rail still was kind of acting separately to the agency because key rail is an SOE and they have to make a profit and they're really focused on the most profitable freight lines rather than a joined up approach that says what's the best outcome for moving people and goods around Dunedin and the lower South Island and the entire South Island and how do we invest in improvements um, to the rail line that maybe will achieve this outcome we want in terms of reducing trucks on the roads. And I'd say like that sort of has started, but it's really far from actually happening. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thought it would be easier than that. Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, um, did you see that I think what's on normal about proximity to the port? Um, 
he, he's just written an article in the next, last couple of days, I think. Um, I didn't see that one. Which was discouraging. He's saying it's all it's failed that the, the council had um, aspirations to have this muted island that would have um, you know higher, higher you know, different road shares and, and less car use and, and everyone is looking at now just uses their car the same as what it's not. So do we know what went wrong and, and why that didn't work out? And it, well, did it go wrong? Is he right? And um, do we know why it went wrong and what, what we need to no, I think probably there's way higher walking mo chair for kids going to school in Hobson Low Point than your average um, neighborhood in in what in Auckland. I don't know. I haven't looked at the data, but that's anecdotally what I've heard. Um, and it could have been higher public transport use, but there's just not enough public transport going there. I mean, the the ferry is actually over. Like they don't have enough ferries, and they don't have enough ferry frequency. And then. Uh, for people who are living there and working in North Auckland or West Auckland or South Auckland, there's no, it's not joined up to Rev Transit Network. So if they'd done that, <laughs> I think it would have worked. But I think within that little neighborhood, um, it's going to feel a lot more people friendly and people will be doing more of their local trips um, without the car than they did in <coughs> another part of the North Shore, like Browns Bay or something. And the final question goes to Donna. Oh, so, you. Um, right, talking about upkeep of roads, I have a real problem with trucking freight in terms of road safety, that type of thing. Um, I know there's a problem as you've just explained with the rail and um, putting things together, but can we currently put, is, is there the capacity currently to put more <coughs> freight on rail? I think the um, capacity is probably somewhat limited by the state of our rail lines and the number, the amount of rolling stock that we have. And I think Kiwi Rail is working on increasing that and have been given a lot of money to increase it, but they were really randomly focused on Northland. It's not random. It's because Shane Jones and Winston Peters were the responsible <laughs> ministers last time. And um, they're like best mates with the chief executive of Kiwi Rail. Um, so I'm not confident that the money's being spent in the best way it could be to really, and I think you, we need to set them a target of trying to increase the amount of freight that, they're, that they are carrying. Um, I think the, the best way to do this is very much for central government to just have a strategic planning approach where they're saying, how do we get more freight onto sustainable modes, whether that's coastal shipping or rail? Um, how do we get more passengers in our cities, um, walking, cycling, using public transport, using a ride sharing? And how do we get more intercity travel options for people that are sustainable and not just reliant on private vehicles? And then what are the investments and policies we need to make to achieve that? That's just what they do in other countries. It's not a radical green idea. It's like mainstream across the political spectrum in the Netherlands and Denmark and Germany and Sweden and Norway. And um, they do it really well. And I just think we should do it a little more like that. Um, but um, I think we need some more structural reform to the transport agency in Kiwi Rail. I think Kiwi Rail shouldn't be an SOE or at least not the tracks bit. Um, maybe you keep it as an SOE just doing the freight operations bit and you put the tracks into a new crown entity that's responsible for um, <coughs> regional and national transport links that, so that they're looking at not just the state highway network, but state highway rail lines and coastal shipping lines. And then you have um, another agency that's responsible for um, passenger services um, and public transport um, and you just set them really clear directions, but you probably need to change some people in some of those positions as well as restructuring it. Julianne, thank you for filling us in and, and for talking. <laughs> thank you. As you can tell, I really love talking about it. <laughs>